All right, to be challenged, um, where the rubber meets the road. Again, I want to continue to focus or try to help you think through where, the, where does the rubber meet the road when we're talking about these blessings the Scripture is telling us about, when Scripture is telling us that we are, we have a new identity, what does that really mean? And what does that look like where the rubber meets the road? Okay? And, and maybe we'll have a little bit of conversation this morning as far as how does that work for you? As far as, you know, what we talk about on Sunday mornings, you know, do you think about it during the week? Or, again, this idea of, I want to keep on talking about identity, blessing, you know, what Paul is saying in Ephesians and what, and what he's declaring as far as the truth about us, what God has done, who we now are, how does that, how does that help you in your daily walk? Or when does it come up? How does it come up? Uh, and I, I know for me, I'm still seeing this, I'm experiencing myself in a normal way, as far as the normal human way. That, so I'm very, I think I'm very aware of uh, my struggle as a human. But, but I think, and, and, I, and I understand I have an advantage, Jeff has an advantage, you know, in teaching. You're, you're, when you teach, it's like you're forced to think about this throughout the week. Whereas if I wasn't teaching, how would I be doing that? You know, I'm not sure. Um, and then I want to say, well, so how do we help each other do that? Whatever that is, okay? That is meaning... How, how do you think about this? Uh, what prompts you to think about it? What relationships do you have to help you think about it? Um, so it's a, and that's that's why I keep on talking about why the church. The church is this built-in, built-in relationships now that really can help us to think about this stuff. So um, I want to see if I want to keep this up here. I kind of like this. Uh, but I, I want to kind of do the left side, right side again, as far as man, humans, and God, okay? So I guess the, I might have to change this a little bit, but I'll keep this up right here. So um, I, I have in my, uh, my notes here, um, and I'm going to use a, a, a country song again, because I listen, I listen to country music. So this song, again, kind of prompted this idea of... Uh, what are you, what are we humans, what are you humans, what are you looking for? I'm talking about in the daily experience, the, the daily experience of life, when you experience your different emotions. So what, just to just throw out some of the normal things that you guys, and I mean more on the struggle side, okay? The normal human side. What do you experience? I'm talking about like, you yourself. What are the struggles that you have throughout the day? <laughs> Sorry, Greg, I see a huge smile back there. It's, uh, you yourself as compared to you, somebody else. I, I just, I'm trying to make sure you're not looking at somebody else and saying, okay, this is what I'm experiencing, you know, in, in that person. No, you. What? Are, go ahead, Greg. So, you know, I look back and I go, tough week. And okay. Then I go, really? You know, there's these two <clears throat> things happening in my head. So uh, we got a new heat pump, nice brand new little heat pump, getting a new roof, and they dumped shingles into my nice brand new heat pump. So, Ooh. so I'm frustrated, you know. And then I step back and I go, uh, grand scheme of things, this is nothing. But. There's a part of me, March, that's that little 5% of me goes, grand scheme of things, this is nothing. But the other 95% goes, <laughs> you, let's talk about it. You know, so, so frustration. Okay, so hold on. Circumstances. So the human, your, the way you experience yourself. You know, I'm leaving this up here because Dave, Dave said this, you know, there's nobody here, we're all going to die. So it's perfect to go, okay, so you said frustration. Yeah, and I can't even explain to myself why I find that so frustrating in the grand scheme of things. Okay, so hold on. So I'm going to go ahead and put, uh, I'll put, um, uh, I'll, I'll put, I'll go ahead and put flesh, okay? Because I want to compare the flesh with 
the, diff, the two different identities that we're talking about, okay? So we'll, this side will be the flesh. So frustration, yeah, what else? How do you experience yourself? What do you struggle with? So there's a word, frustration. What else? Oh. oh, that was good. Oh, yeah. I should have said stop. Just <laughs> anger. No, yeah, my, my wife would resonate with you right now if she was here. Yeah, yeah. I'm not alone. I know that. You are not alone. Okay, anger. Anger and is interesting because she said at. So there's usually an object. Object at the end of that. But let's we'll leave it at anger. So frustration, anger. Yeah. What'd you say, Jack? Insufficient. What do you mean? That I'm falling short, that I'm, I'm believing the lies, that I'm not enough. Okay, I'll, I'll put I am. Well, what, but but how, okay, so let's take that to feeling. So what does that make you feel? I mean, what what's going on there? So the example is Thursday mornings we have a all staff meeting, and as leadership we announce our new hires, and so I go up and there's like six new hires, and everybody ahead of me knows something about their new employee employee knows their hobbies, knows all this stuff about them, are going out there and doing this great description of this new employee so everybody kind of gets to know him and I go up there and I, got, I know nothing about him. I know he's going to do work for me and he started, so let's go, work. But then I go, like after announcing it, it's like I let him down, I, and it's, I'm not a good manager, I should have known more about him, I should have presented huh, okay. better, and I start believing all these lies that I've made this big colossal failure as a leader. Okay. Um, I'm insufficient, not enough. Uh, failure. Or I'll say fail. Okay, I'll put failure. Okay. Good. Yeah, the internal struggle, the internal talk. All right, what other what other things? I'm thinking of one in particular that is kind of a constant with me, and that's the just dissatisfied. You know, that can go to all kinds of stuff, you know, whether it's, um, yeah, whatever. Just um, not satisfied. Anybody else want to put some other things in there? I know that unfulfilled, unsatisfied, not fulfilled, not satisfied, fulfilled. Anything else? Jealousy. Jealousy. Um, covetousness. So jealous. So the same covetousness. I'll say coveting. I mean, to me, that I, that goes well with not satisfied because I'm I'm not satisfied with either either what I have or who I am, and I'm jealous or coveting something else. It can be things and, or yeah, you're looking at what other people have. Yep. And I mean, that can be both things and or character stuff, you know. Okay, good. Anything else you guys got in your mind that you haven't said? I think in inadequacy probably goes with what Jack said. Yeah, insufficiency, not enough. Inadequ inadequacy, I'm not, I'm not enough. I'm, yeah. I'm inadequate. Okay. Yeah, great. So I can, I can relate <clears throat> to all of those. And the bottom, foundational for me, is I feel ripped. Okay. And I'm angry because I feel ripped off by somebody. I'm frustrated because, you know, why can't I have a heat pump that's not damaged for at least a week, or please let me do it myself, you know. Um, I'm going to so, put not fair. Yeah, yeah. Ripped off. And again, that can be all-encompassing. Either, you know, well, you're a victim. I mean, right, that's a victim mentality, Okay. Entitled victim. You're you are an entitled victim, Greg. Thank you. Um, but but this is the human experience. If you, if you think about it this way, that I mean, the way we are in the flesh, as normal sinful creatures, fallen creatures, where God let. We've already said it over and over again in Romans, where God, because of what we desire, He lets us pursue that. These are the fruits of that. You guys follow on that, right? This is the fruit. This is normal human living. 
frustration, anger, failure, insufficient. So listen to this song real quick. And I, I thought it was maybe more relevant than it is, but um, this is a song called I Wish Grandpas Never Die. Okay, and again, think of the human, hear the humanness in it. It says, I, I wish girls you love never gave back diamond rings. I wish every porch had a swing. Wish kids still learned to say sir and ma'am, how to shake a hand. It's got some other things. Uh, I wish Monday mornings felt just like Friday nights. I wish even cars had truck beds. Every road was named Copperhead. Of course, and coolers never run out of cold Bud Light. That's the, there's the country thing. I wish home school, high school home teams never lost. I wish the price of gas was low and cotton was high. He's from the South. I wish grandpas never died. I wish everybody overseas was going to make it home. I wish good dogs never got gray and old. I wish farms never got sold. I mean, what do you hear from the human experience? Especially with what we, I mean, what, what's going on there? What? Loss. So loss. And what's the struggle with loss? Just again, from a human perspective. And this is where I, I wrote, when thinking about this song, said, what, what, are you, what are we looking for? Especially when you experience yourself with this stuff, what are you wanting? So you experience something, and you experience loss, you're ripped off. It's not fair. You're looking at something that you wish you had and you don't have. You know what? Just fill in the blanks as far as what we... What, so then try to put it... Think about it in a different way. What are you, what are you hoping for? What are you wanting? What are you desiring? Unrealistic desire for a world without pain. Okay. Now you said unrealistic, but, but in a very real sense... It, it's both ends, so I'm not saying that, that that's wrong. It is unrealistic, but... But what is unrealistic? What is the unrealistic expectation? I, I crave rest and security in those things. And so, the, I mean, everything on the board runs that. And when, I, when I experience loss, it, it affects my rest and the level of security I experience. What do, I'll, I'll say you, What do you want? I'm going to put an exclamation point there, and then I'm going to, let's see, we go. So you just, I'm going to put rest, security. And again, uh, Patrick, why did you say unrealistic expectations? First of all, what are the expectations? And then we can go to why, why is it unrealistic? Again, I'm just trying to see if you guys can put words to it. What, what is the expectation? Especially when you experience this, what are you expecting? Realistic expectation is that bad things are going to happen, period. Okay, so expectation number one, you just said, I don't want bad things to happen, however that's defined, okay? I don't want my roof stuff to fall into my new doggone heat pump, all right? That's just, that's a, I don't want to say stupid, but it, it's just a normal little... <laughs> Stupid expectation. It's a, it's a, yeah, go, back, go behind the, the pillar there. Um, so I don't, there, there's just a, there's a vague one. I don't want bad stuff to happen. So what, what else, if you want to keep peeling that back, what, am I, what do I expect, what do I want? Yeah, Greg. I don't want to be subject, I think foundationally, I don't want to be subject to the fall. And everything that comes out of that, because that all comes out of that. that. That puts me in my flesh. You know that that gives me a by the sweat of my brow. That gives me uh, the flesh profits nothing. You know I think <clears throat> down at the bottom, even though my my self righteous flesh probably says there's got to be a way out of this. I can figure it out. I just need a new way to think, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I just want to be. I don't want to be under. The Okay. Subject to the fall. I don't really know how to put that up here. Um, and again, I'm, I'm trying to think of the practical words to that. You're, you're talking about that like from a Christian perspective. It's talking about, I don't want to be subject to the fall, which I agree with you, yes. But what does that, what's that mean every day? What, what, what do I want? What do I don't want? Redemption. You want redemption. Yeah, but I want other people to give it to me. Okay, and... and 
I want redemption, especially when you're talking about that from other people. What's another, and I don't have a word in my mind, what, what's another way of saying that? Because when I think of, when I hear the word redemption, I think of Jesus and God, you know, in that sense. So what does that mean with other people? We go back, I, I hate to keep, this is not really a conversation between me and you, but you asked the question, and I think, I want to be sovereign, and I want what I want. And I want people to do what I believe they should. So I want compliance. Okay. But it's unrealistic because that's the compliance fault. to me and my uh, standards, my right and wrong. I mean that that's a kind of a good way to put it in the fleshly sense because yeah, what do I expect? I expect the people around me to comply with what I believe is good and, and, and not good. And again, that's, that's still vague in general. Um, okay, anything else? Again, what do you want? Control. Control? Yeah. And by control, we want control because we want a certain outcome. Yeah, what's the outcome? The outcome, I mean, words that are coming to my mind, which is not everything, but <clears throat> like wholeness, wellness things to work, you know, people to play along with our plan, and things to play along with our plan, wholeness, wellness. I'm going to put peace, yeah, wholeness, and this, hold on, I, just real quick thought, I, I mean, it's, remember, we, we started to go through the personality stuff, the Enneagram, okay, that's not a pentagram. The Enneagram stuff. So it's personality. We we're, were talking about personality stuff. Tracy's, you know, still rummaging that up some more. Well, Ronnie was reading the book, and she, you know, Ronnie is all of a sudden really interested in my personality. <laughs> we all are. We all. Are. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> you're an eight. So we think it's a seven. Oh, a seven. We think it's a seven. I don't know what the side shoots are, but it's boiled down to I just want to have fun. I mean, this is the expectation thing, right? The wholeness wellness, the peace, and listen, I, and I think that's why, because Ronnie's been baffled, you know, when she first married me, she thought I was going to be this awesome dad, okay, probably a bunch of other things too, I don't know, but she thought, you know, I was a youth pastor, I loved kids, I was really good with kids, coach, all this kind of stuff, well, I'm kind of the opposite as a dad, all right, apparently, at home, and I, and I, I, I realize that, I struggle with it. But I struggle with anger and frustration and dissatisfaction as a dad. Well, a lot of that is, at least, I mean, I, I can blame, I, I can kind of blame, I, I think this is blaming, but circumstantially, I, I, conflict drives me crazy. So when my kids are in conflict with each other, and the bickering and the arguing and the complaining and the, it just, it sets me, I mean, it, it sets me off from 0 to 120 immediately. And so Ronnie and I were talking about, because she's reading the book and she's reading these little th things that were like, whoa, yeah, that's, that's me. And, but this idea of, I just, I just want wholeness. I want, I want peace. I want quiet. And it boils down to this. I want to have fun. And, and what, especially what's, being, what's happening with my, my kids and in their interrelationships with each other and it interrupts my sense of fun, and it's the opposite, it, then it, that's where I, I just really struggle with that. Why did I bring that up? I, I could think it had the, I, that idea with, yeah, I want wellness, I want peace, I want wholeness. I just want to have fun. And when something interrupts that, the, then my sense of right and wrong, and my, what I want, the compliance, you know, the compliance isn't happening. And yet, so it's directly tied to everything we talk about regarding the self-sovereign. My sovereignty, I have an idea of right and wrong, and I, and I have this flavor that I just want to have fun in everything that I do. I just want it to be fun. And when that's threatened, when it's interrupted, then the lashing out begins. The lashing out of the heart. Yeah, that looks... And then there's, uh, there's things that happen, obviously, relationally with that, but the real struggle that I have almost all the time, not almost, all the time... It's funny because uh, Jack and I saw each other at Costco the, yesterday and we again had the talk about referees. 
you know, in the in the context of a basketball game. Um, and it's it's like I don't I I don't know if I can just enjoy a basketball game. And again, the thing there is I want to have fun. It's exciting. It's I want a certain outcome, right? And that outcome plays out in a thousand different things just in watching a basketball game. I hope you guys can realize that about yourself in every aspect of life. Uh, Dave, what were you going to say? Do you remember? Yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think the ability to affect change or uh, along the lines of the control piece. So I don't just, I mean, I want control. I also crave power <coughs> or the ability to be able to modify the circumstances and people around, like, and, and sort of build the world that I think should exist. So there's like that we always talk about the frustrated sovereigns, is that I can't like that that is out of my hands. I have no control. Of, like I don't have control over whether or not my kids are fighting or being kind to one another. All of a sudden it happens, and you know I'm like, what are you like? What are you doing? It's funny you just said power. So I've never understood, even in our talking about uh, so sovereignty, the idea of you know um, secular psychology is talking about that a lot about you know the individual wanting power. You know, because to me, I, I don't feel like I want power. But just even when you said that, what, what do you want the power to do? Have fun. I want the power to have fun and to, to affect that around me. So you said control. So there's control and power. Because I never thought, that, I don't want power. I don't want a whole bunch of people. To, I don't, I'm not gathering a kingdom to be powerful. Not in that sense. But I am. Guess what I am? I do. I want the power to be able to control my kingdom so that it, it's just fun. Or whatever it is your flavor is, okay? That's the power. Well, it just sort of boils down to that. And this is where we can all relate, because Jill and I have been having these Enneagram conversations too. I mean, we all want fun, we just define it differently. You know what I mean? For some people, We're organizing just... files in a file cabinet is fun because it makes them feel good. Whatever it is, it doesn't even matter. We all have that something that's enjoyable to us. I mean, Jill and I were talking about planning vacation yesterday, privately, without the kids involved, right? And I'm laying out, all oh, we can do this and The this vacation and this. or the plan? We're planning a vacation, looking at what we can do, right? And I'm saying, oh, we can do this and this and this. And she said, because of her training now, thanks, Tracy, hey, is that fun for everybody or is that fun for you? <laughs> I'm like... Hey, great point. I will tell the kids what will be fun. I will determine for them what fun is for them. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of that. So that's just, it is. It's the human, it's the human predicament, man. Well, I think, too, that they're, I think that's, I like superhero movies, like the Marvel movies, you know, and some of the DC movies. But I think there is and has been sort of this obsession with power. I think one of the fascinating... Yeah, well, hold on. Power in the sense of strength and... and strength, being able to... In other words, being able to affect and change and, and modify the circumstances, right? Like Superman saves a person falling out of a building or something. There's a, sort of an obsession with that. Like, man, that, that would be amazing to be able to do that. But I think that does speak to this in that we... That is what we, we crave deep down. And I think of this... I'm a frustrated sovereign in that it, I can't affect that change. I can't, I can't stop people from starving or dying, I can't stop people from hurting one another. I can't, you know, by by snapping my fingers, wipe out people that I want to be wiped out, no matter how much they frustrate me on the freeway, or how many times they get cut off, you know, I can't just snap and they're gone. And there's that part of me, and I think part of all of us, that, that craves that. So I've got a little different flavor, which says, <clears throat> I just want everybody to do what they should do. If everybody would do what they should do, everything would be fine. And it's hard to recognize that as a level of wanting control, because I, I decide what the standard is, I decide what the shoulds are. I'm not going to make you do it, but I'm going to be really upset if you don't. I mean, and even as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, from the individual, normal human perspective, I have, an, I have a picture, an idea, I mean, a, a gigantic, comprehensive idea of how sh people should act. Okay? I just, it, it's just automatic. You guys have it too. And to me, that's just, that's normal. And you should know it. 
This is where I joke with the Army folks and say I'm shitting all over you, all right, with the appropriate pun. I'm shitting on you. So I'm thinking that's normal, and I believe you already know what you should do according to my definition. Now the, now the way we understand this biblically now is, hey, that's different for everybody. Patrick's shoulds are different than Leonard's shoulds. And so the reason we're always colliding is because you think Leonard should comply. Leonard, obviously, that's what I, I love it when people use the word obviously. Obviously, they should know what is right and what's wrong. Well, no, that's not the truth. It's obvious to you. But it's it's, not obvious it's to completely them. obvious to me. So even my internal wrestling over the fact that Patrick or my kid isn't doing what is obviously the right thing to do. I pick up the sock that he just tripped over. I mean, my boy doesn't even see the sock that he left there eight days ago. Seems pretty obvious to me, doesn't it? And I'm sitting here, I mean, that's my... And I'm, I'm mad that I just watched him step over the sock eight times. And then I, eventually, when I deal with it, it's, a, it's an unloading of, you obviously saw the sock, and you stepped over it, and now I'm, I'm telling you, pick up... What, what, what do you think the reaction is? I didn't see the Thanks sock. Thanks for informing me, Dad. <laughs> Thanks, all you had to do was ask me. What do you mean? It's obvious you should pick up your dirty sock that's been there, you know. But if, that's just the, the example. It, you automatically have an understanding of what should be. And you are imposing it on everybody around you. The problem is they have, they don't, they have a completely different set of shoulds that may be intertwined, that may be related. That's the human experience. And that's the frustrated sovereign. That's why so us people are constantly in a state of basically dissatisfaction and frustration. Yeah, so Jeff. That's why I've seen the Enneagram be helpful. <laughs> like, it's, it's insane. Because the last time we met, we talked about um, meeting people. And I did not think that I was relational. But I'm very relational <laughs> because <laughs> when I see a new person come to church, my natural inclination, I put myself in that spot, and it's like, I would want somebody to come say hello to me. Because my experience was, when I was looking for a church, if I walked into a church and it didn't greet me, I didn't stay, yeah. I just turned around and walked back. Right. Yeah. And hearing Tracy say that, I'm okay just coming and nobody would ever have to talk to me. And I'm going, no, that's, no, she says, really? Like, and Doug says, I'm the same way. We go to church our whole lives, nobody come talk to you, and you'd be okay with that. Yeah, and they're almost the opposite. If somebody keeps coming up to me and saying hello and what's your name and I, I want to meet you, it's almost like it, it's it's a burden or, yes. or or a negative. Whereas for you, it's a it's a positive and it's a necessary component. Whereas they may get out and walk up of two walk out of the church if two people come say hello to them. And that floored me because I did not consider myself relational. Like so. You see how screwed up we humans are. I mean, in 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 the old identity. So now think of that, this in, the, in like the different identity now. So our expectations, our hopes, our desires are in the, That's where I even said, you know, what is reality? You guys already brought that up. You know, what's reality like in the song? I, I wish grandpas never died. Well, guess what? Guess what happens to grandpas? Guess what happens to dogs? They grow old and die. The, the, you know, what he is... What he is expressing in the song are his desires. It's this desire for, you know, even, even the, you know, I don't know what's, what road he's talking about. I wish every, every road was named Copperhead. Well, he's got a, he's got a memory. He's got a, a, something either happened or he's, he's got something that was good that, that met an expectation, met a desire or, or whatever. But reality is what? It, it, you know, again, in the, in the military, I say, what we desire and the way we desire it is a moving target. It's constantly changing. It's constantly moving. When I think I've attained to a certain expectation, whether that's relation in anything, whether it's relational or some practical thing, practical thing being like, I just bought this new heat pump. This is great. You know, I, get, I feel a sense of satisfaction. I, it, you know, whatever. Whatever Greg felt. And then guess what comes along? Dumb roofers that can't do something right according to your definition of right. I'm with Greg on that one. That's just a standard. That's just dumb. They, they should have known that. Right. 
So, but hey, oh well, they didn't, they didn't meet a normal standard. So now let's go back to Ephesians and how this can help us where the rubber meets the road. This is normal. And even, and we've already talked about that transition period to where, hey, we're saved now. I, I, I can embrace the fact that everybody in here, you, you believe that you are saved. Okay, now what, what does that mean now, according to what the Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians? Again, the interesting thing is, you are still recognizing this about yourself, right? This does not magically disappear when you become saved. So now how can it help? And not just from a, like a theoretical or philosophical point of view. Philosophical being, hey, when Paul says now, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So let's list, I mean, we've already listed that stuff out. Just uh, open up to, well, I wanted to go here first. So Ephesians 2, because we've already covered Ephesians 1 and talking about all those different blessings. So Ephesians 2, somebody, uh, go ahead. I know Greg's got his, um, see, you're still the target, Greg, just so you know. I know uh, King James, especially when you have King James, you're the target. I'm thinking about watching this on tape. I guess there's no such thing anymore. I'm getting there. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead. Read it, Jeff. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay, so hold on right there. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And I want to again highlight this idea that what we keep talking about at our church, again, it's easy to think about trespasses and sins as far as activities and actions. Bad stuff. Okay, so that, that we are basically condemned for or by. Well, I want to I want to say we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We are that's this. We're dead with this heart, with this mind. You get, right? Everybody gets that now? I'm dead because I have this heart that craves this stuff. And I have a certain definition of that stuff. And I impose that definition of stuff on everybody out there, and the fruits of that are only what? Death. It's death. And, the, and the, the side effects of that is, you know, frustration, anger, all the, the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. And death is defined as numbness uh, and not being aware of Christ. Is that what death is defined well, as? When you say I'm dead in my sins, does that mean I'm, I'm unaware of my sins? I'm numb to my sins? Yes, and, you know, specifically what Paul's talking about there is spiritual deadness. So, Spiritually, I am dead. I am. I'm, of course, he's gonna. We're gonna continue to see what he says right there, as far as I'm separated from God. I'm separated from Christ. Um, I, I only deserve condemnation and judgment from God, and all the stuff that you're talking about. Hey, I'm not aware. In my deadness, of course, that's why I love like writing it out like this. In my deadness, I believe I'm my sovereign. I'm sovereign in my life. I, I mean, what does that sound like to you when I say, I'm the sovereign in my life? Because it's really hard for people to, most people don't think, don't think of themselves, themselves as a God. But when I say, when you're dead in your trespasses and sins, that means everything, my worldview is, I'm the sovereign. What does that mean? I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the one that, that's why I struggle so much. I'm the one that wants control of my life. I'm the one that craves control of my life. And with those different, you guys have all those different flavors. I just want to have fun. I want comfort, peace, and joy. I want security. And, and I, I have a way that I'm trying to control that and direct that. I am the sovereign. That's why, again, especially you know, church people, they, they don't necessarily look back prior to being saved and, and, they, and they don't necessarily believe that Hey, I, I wanted, I craved to be the God of my life. They don't, they don't see it like that. But if you can understand it like that, I'm the sovereign. What, Jeff? Well, just, just to elaborate on the, the God thing. So, Adam and Eve, you know, that's what, hey, the day you eat that fruit, you will die, right? And they did not die physically that day. But being a little g God is death. It's separation from the true God. It is death, and the symptoms of death, if the <clears throat> symptoms of physical death are a body that doesn't move, you know, and 
the other aspects of decomposition that take place. The symptoms of spiritual death are in this little G-godness. Everything that goes along with that, which is endless cravings, endless discontentment, endless anger, endless frustration, en endless anxiety, endless jealousy, endless coveting, all the stuff that's listed on the board, those are symptoms of death, right? Th that's what it looks like to be spiritually dead. And yeah, so anyway, well, I think about so we yeah. call it dead, that's what we mean. I was just thinking that back to that concept of being enlightened. If you, if just practically speaking, if you turn off the lights, all that's left for you is darkness. I mean, in the grander sense, man rejected God. Rejected God. We rejected dependence on God, and, and opted for independence. Which, if you reject life, consequently, all that's left for you is death. And if you reject light, all that's left for you is darkness. And the Bible uses those two. Uh, those two pictures really to paint that clearly, but it speaks back to that word enlightened that you have up there on the board, Don. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that you guys are saying, it, again, I want to emphasize, because Ronnie and I are talking about this a lot, the Romans 1 concept that, that, again, back in the beginning with Adam and Eve, they believed a lie about God. So they exchanged the truth about God for a lie about God, Okay. And again, that lie about God that Adam and Eve believed was everything kind of were putting, you know, they didn't believe that God knew what was best for them. They didn't believe that God wanted what was best for them. They didn't, I mean, what else do you want to put in there? Well, what were the lies that they believed about God? Couldn't trust God. They couldn't they trust lie. God. So we could say it in light of what we were talking about earlier. They couldn't, we can't trust God to provide for our happiness or fun or whatever you want to call it. Wholeness, wellness. We, I have got to go get that for myself. Right. And, and so again, what, I think it's some funny things in TV land and everything else. Humans automatically automatically believe I know me. Nobody else does. I'm the one that knows me. I'm the one that knows what's best for me. I'm the one that knows what is going to make me happy. You don't. And that's what, that's what Adam and Eve, essentially that's what happened with, between them and God. I want to decide. You don't know me. I mean, we don't see that blatantly in Scripture, but I think that's exactly what took place. And that God, was, God is withholding. And God was with. I mean, that's the thing. That's the, the interesting thing about the lie about God, is that God, everything that God was doing was for them, was for their best in mind. It was a result of His love and grace and mercy for them. He wanted to be known as a benevolent, merciful, loving God. And everything that he did, that they were the object of his love, and they turned that around. And they didn't believe it. So the deadness is it, it gets us all of this. And you're right, and you're not even aware of it. That's why it's just like it's like you're because you're in the dark, you're just jamming your head against the wall over and over again, trying to trying to get the same stuff, trying to control the same people, or what you know, whatever in your life. And then salvation, and we'll keep on reading uh, to, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. So, but you are dead in your trespasses and sin. Again, trespasses and sin is this, I believe a lie about God, I know me, and I am, I am serving myself as the sovereign in my life. Yeah, Jeff, keep going. Which, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience, among them too, sorry, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Okay, hold on. So again, if, you, if you've grown, grown up in the church, it's too easy to, to, to think the lusts of the flesh are these things that you didn't never really do, okay? No, we're saying the lust of the flesh is everything we just put out on the board in detail. The lust of the flesh is your desire and, and, and the, the understanding, I know me, I know me best, I'm the one that determines what's best for me. And that clashes with your creator, okay? So that's the lust of the flesh, and as a result, you said what, Jeff? Indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind were by nature children of wrath. By nature children of wrath. Yep. 
go ahead, finish that before you get to but God. Uh, it's where it stops. But by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest, and then it goes to but God, verse 4. Okay, so you have this, this ant-filled world. If you were to look at it, you know, from, you can't even, it's, you can't even see humans from 30,000 feet, thinking about me being in the airplane, you know, this, this week. But think about this, this ant hill of humans to where it's just a, it's a bunch of humans down there that are children of wrath. Literally like that. Of course, we know that ants have rhyme and reason and a purpose down there. But it's almost like, hey, we're all clashing with each other. It's, it's just this mound of anger and frustration and, and wrath because of the lust of the flesh. Which is, we're all little sovereigns down there trying to get what we believe is going to satisfy us. Yeah, great. So in reference to the flesh, like you said, it's easy to, to go, okay, that's the bad stuff. You know, that's, that's idolatry, that's adultery, that's all the other trees that are in the woods there. But Jesus said, whatsoever is born of the flesh is flesh. That's why he said you have to be born again. And then he said the flesh profits nothing. And this links the desires of the flesh with the way of the world, this world system. So if I'm, and the world system is everything else thrown up on the board, because that's the only way the flesh knows how to act. So I think what I appreciate about this ministry is it's not about something external manifestation of the flesh, but it starts to dig down into the heart and says, how does the flesh practically manifest itself in my life and do I recognize it as that or do I not? Okay, so how does the, how does the flesh daily manifest itself? And like, like Jack gave the example that he gave earlier regarding hey, I'm just at work introducing a new employee and now he's wrestling with himself thinking he's not sufficient that he, he messed something up or you know whatever it is that, that you're struggling with or the, the jealousy or the coveting or the the frustration over the, the event. That, so all of that is a manifestation of the old man. Okay? And then we'll talk about this, where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I think this is coming together in my health, my head in a helpful way. But good. Good. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to think out loud for a second. So if you think of the world we live in, and that's the way it works with all of us. And we're all 7 billion people down here, like you said, like ants, just wrangling around and banging into each other with that. So how... So then how does the world manage that? Well, what we do is we create a, a, an agreed-upon system of shoulds, whether that be the civil law of our land, or you think of like basketball, I'll keep using that example because of how much you know, you're involved and I'm involved with that. Hey, we agree upon a set of rules for the league, and now that's kind of unifying. Now we're still going to argue about how those, how those laws are, are uh, uh, enforced by the ref, but, but there's at least a set of agreed-upon laws and shoulds that we can abide by and we can all agree. So so we do that in different spheres of life, politics and other spheres. We pick a team and we say we're going to operate with these shoulds and we're going to agree on these shoulds. Well, there's always battling that goes on about the specifics, but at least that, that can be unifying to a degree. Well, Paul here, when he talks about the Gentile Jewish difference, it's like he's talking about two different systems of shoulds and he's saying, hey, in the church, Rather than it being just a new sphere in which to establish a new agreed upon set of shoulds, it's completely different from all of that. It's completely different in that it is the one, it's the one community in which we are learning to, we're learning to live in God apart from the shoulds. We're, we're learning love. We're learning, uh, we're learning tolerance and, and peace and and teamwork in a way that's different than every other sphere. So, whereas for all of us, church has at one time been just a different team to be on and, and a different set of shoulds to fight for in advance, now what we're saying is, hey, every week we're here to be exposed for all of that way of our MO is being exposed, and we're seeing that's, that's what's killing me every day. Me, and, and that's what's a threat to my relationships, and the gospel creates a completely foreign sphere in which to live where, in a very real sense, God's voice has put an end to all the shoulds. Like, okay. So that could go on. But is that... Yeah, you guys, I hope you get this because, I mean, this is kind of our, our uh, soundbite 
at least through the next few months in this year, is, and it has been for me now for a year, is this idea of shoulds versus what is. Okay, and it becomes perfectly clear, I think, right now, especially the way Jeff was just saying that, how I want to lay this out, okay? Yeah, typical church has been you're exchanging one set of shoulds for another set of shoulds, all right? You're exchanging the world's shoulds for God's shoulds. But in essence, you're just, you're just exchanging one burden for another. And I'm not saying that there aren't certain expectations and things that Paul talks about later on in Ephesians as far as activities, that you could, uh, you could define as shoulds. Now, I think we can talk about them in a different way uh, as far as kind of where we're going uh, in, in Ephesians. All right, and this is going to be great because I'm talking through Ephesians and now Jeff's preaching through Ephesians, so we're going to get all different angles to this. But the way I want to explain this and the way that I think Paul lays this out is, hey, you're already overburdened with shoulds. And... Guess what Paul is saying now? And this is where the rubber meets the road. When I experience myself still in the flesh, that I'm still, because again, the habitual way of living is I'm the sovereign. I am, this is just what I'm used to doing. This is just what I'm used to thinking. This is what I'm used to controlling, okay? Now, now God says, I have made you into a new creation or new creature. Remember, we've already talked about all those verses. You are therefore now a new creature. Creation. You're a new creature. You're no longer this. The old is gone. The new has come. Galatians 5, 1. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Well, guess what that guess what you're freed from? You're free from the burden of your sovereignty. It's a huge burden. And our, our identity is no longer defined by it. And now your identity, you are no longer the king, little K, or God, little G of your life, that you are insisting to be which is crazy burden, crazy shackles. Paul says in Ephesians, and he says now, go ahead, read the rest. He says, but God, go ahead, Greg, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us together in heavenly places in Christ. You want to read it? That's good. So, but God, he's made you alive. You were dead. This is deadness. This is the way you were, just like everybody else. And now he says, but guess what? But God, because of his love for us, because of his great mercy, he has made you alive. And that aliveness is something totally different. Yeah, that enlightening. You know, that we, when we talk about that enlightened word, he has enlightened us. And in a sense... You know, Paul prays in chapter 1, he, 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 he's praying that God enlighten us more and more about our aliveness. So he's made you alive, and now Paul is saying, I'm explaining to you what that aliveness is. So it's every spiritual blessing is already given. You, so I'll say, you have every... spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, okay? And again, I mean, I, I don't know, I just thought of, you know, again, the fruits of the Spirit, just because, hey, what, what are we craving? That's the irony. Well, guess what we're craving? Or what are we craving? You've already said. Comfort, peace, the first two words that, um, that David said was rest and security. But because I'm the sovereign... I have a way in which, one, I'm defining what rest and security looks like, or comfort and peace, or fun, whatever it is. Um, and then I, I believe I know how to acquire that. Again, the problem is, though, it's a moving target. So every time I think I get it a little bit, it's gone again, okay? But he says, you have every spiritual blessing. So what, what, is, what does that sound like to you in light of what our constant, frantic searching has always been? What's, he, what's God saying? Already given it to you. Yeah. Let's think what Paul said. Thank you. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to describe that new identity that's wrapped up in Christ, while also the present reality of the nature of sin still exists. <clears throat> is it isn't done away with in our flesh. 
You have every spiritual blessing, everything that we've already said in chapter 1. Every spiritual blessing, you are adopted as a son and a daughter. What else do you want to say about it? Forgiven. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. You use the word, I'm looking for redemption. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. You're loved. So now, again, what we, we, what we keep on getting to is how does this then... How, how can we shift our thinking when I experience myself in the old way to where it is a springboard to go, whoa, wait a minute, I'm still functioning in this way. How do I now make a decision? Can you make a decision? We can't answer that right now, but can, you, can we make a decision together and help each other to go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, time out. I'm a new creature. I'm no longer this anymore. And how, does, how can that happen and what, what could be or maybe is the results or are the results for you when this change of thinking happens? I don't, I can't, I got to stop here. I got eager people in the back. Land the plane now. Land the plane. <laughs> Land the helicopter. Hopefully good. So this is what we keep on getting to. Um, but yeah, let's pray. I'll just stop us abruptly. Dear Lord God, I thank you. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord God, to, um, to believe not just in you, but to believe that what you've said regarding our new identity is true, and that we truly can rest in you. We can rest in your grace and in your love. I thank you for all the, the words of scripture that you've given us that explain in detail what is, what is true about you, and what is now true about us. Help us to believe it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.